So, good morning, one and all. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Vitro Retina Society of India for giving me this opportunity. I'll be discussing care to be taken during indirect ophthalmoscopy and laser indirect ophthalmoscopy. It was just four years into VR practice and I developed cervical disc prolapse at the level of C5, C6 and had a compression at the C6 nerve root. I had severe pain and radicular pain in the left arm. Most of the spine surgeons suggested that I have to undergo a surgical intervention if the symptoms does not subside. It was really scary. It was just four years into practice and still a long way to go, but I was not able to work or travel. It took almost two to three months of rest, physiotherapy and medications to get back to a normal, rather I would say a near normal condition. So this is not just my story. If we go through the literature, we come across various sur surveys which show a high incidence of musculoskeletal diseases among ophthalmologists. The data is really alarming. Up to 8% of ophthalmologists require surgical intervention to treat work-related musculoskeletal diseases and 9% were forced to give up operating prematurely due to chronic pain. If we go by the survey on VR surgeons, it was noted that 55% reported both back and neck pain. Only 15% were asymptomatic and 7% required a surgical intervention. A survey in India showed that performing retinal lasers and indirect ophthalmoscopy has a strong association with a chronic backache. So why indirect ophthalmoscopy is harmful? We need to understand a few basic things to understand how it harms our back and neck. We should understand what is a neutral position. Neutral position is one in which the neck, the muscles, the tendon and the joints are at ease. So this is the neutral position in which the head is, in, is directly on the spine and we can see that the ears will be just above the shoulders. A forward head position increases the weight of head on the spine. As we can see here, a forward head position leads to a significant increase in weight of head on the spine. A flexion of more than 20 degrees, that's the neck flexion, causes severe strain on the neck and it is okay to flex between 0 to 20 degrees. So we can see here, even with proper technique, the ophthalmologist is forced to maintain abnormal posture during indirect ophthalmoscopy. This is almost an ideal table height, but still we can see that the neck has to be flexed, which is away from the neutral position. And sometimes, like as we can see over here, to see the superior periphery, we have to bend so much so that the entire back, neck, everything is bent. So this causes strain on the neck and back. So how to reduce the strain during indirect ophthalmoscopy? Choose a lighter indirect ophthalmoscope. I repeat, I don't have any financial disclosure or financial interest over here. So a lighter indirect ophthalmoscope is better as if the viewing system is heavier, the weight is directed downwards and it causes strain on the neck muscles. If we, when doing indirect ophthalmoscopy, we really don't feel that it is very heavy, but once we have to understand that we do this regularly for years together and finally this will definitely have an harmful effect on the neck. The other measure is maintaining or adjusting a proper height of examination table. As we can see over here, a table which is lower needs more bending, whereas a table which is appropriately adjusted does not lead excessive bending of back or neck. So when we bend excessively, we can see here that the head will be forward and this will lead to excess weight on the back, which will cause strain on the neck and back muscles. 
So one more thing is restrict the use of indirect ophthalmoscopy for periphery screening. As we can see over here, for a peripheral screening, we need not bend our neck excessively, whereas for seeing the posterior pole in supine position, we have to bend our neck, flex our neck excessively so that it will cause stress on the back, back and the neck muscles. So better to use a slit lamp biomicroscopy for examination of posterior pole and mid periphery and restrict the use of indirect ophthalmoscopy for periphery screening. We know that slit lamp biomicroscopy has a better magnification and better depth of perception and it's also helpful in assessing the disease. The other option is to use a sitting posture. The advantage of using a sitting posture is that we can examine the patient with neutral position. As we can see over here, I am maintaining an exact neutral position, but still maintain to examine the fundus of the patient. Here we can see that even with an ideal posture, the neck has to be flexed when we are examining in a supine position. It has an additional advantage that the back can be supported on the backrest so that the strain further decreases. But the issue is that we will not be able to examine the superior and inferior aura clearly with sitting posture and scleral indentation is not possible. And again, when we are using a sitting posture, we have to maintain proper positioning. We should make use of the advantages it offers, that is maintaining a neutral position and using a backrest. If we don't use it, the point of using a sitting poster for examination is really not helpful. So as we can see, excessive bending during indirect ophthalmoscopy, even in sitting position, has the same adverse effect as what it has with the supine position. So always try to rest your back and maintain a neutral position while recording findings or while counseling the patients. We should maintain a neutral position, support our back while recording our findings and even while counseling patients. If we bend forward or we are not supporting our back, the strain which was there during examination continues to be present even in between examination and the harm is more. And most important is strengthen your neck and back muscles so that even if we have to maintain an abnormal posture, this strong neck and back muscles will prevent any harm to the spine. Because we are forced to use a supine position most of the time to do a proper indentation during surgery, the spiral buckling, during laser indirect ophthalmoscopy. So, it's not always possible to maintain a neutral position, but try as much as possible to maintain a neutral position and make sure that your neck and back muscles are always strong. When coming to laser indirect ophthalmoscopy, there are additional issues other than the indirect ophthalmoscope itself. The viewing system is definitely heavier when compared to an indirect ophthalmoscope. So there will be more strain on the neck muscles and particularly while performing laser for a longer duration, like ROP laser, we have to flex our neck for a longer duration with a heavier viewing system in front. So it's really painful. So how to reduce strain? One option is restricting the use of laser indirect ophthalmoscopy for anterior lesions, which are not amenable to slit lamp delivery and prefer slit lamp laser delivery for posterior lesions. When performing a longer procedure, take breaks in between and make sure that you rest your neck and back during that break. You may feel that we will finish off the work early and leave, but it's better to take break in between and work for a longer duration rather than finishing that work on that particular day early. So future direction, in cases with loops, there's a thing called ergonomic loop. Here we can see that the eyepiece is directed downwards so that without an excess flexion, the examiner is able to see the patient easily. So development of such design with IDO may be beneficial in future.
to summarize always try to maintain a neutral position avoid excessive flexion of neck and back use a lighter indirect ophthalmoscope maintain a proper adjustment in terms of examination table restrict indirect ophthalmoscopy for peripheral screening try to examine with sitting posture whenever it is sufficient i don't recommend that we have to examine in sitting position because we may miss a few findings and we may not be able to do a thorough examination but whenever it is sufficient we can try to get away with a sitting posture and particularly if you already have an issue earlier like you had already had a neck or a back problem it's better to use sitting posture whenever it is sufficient take breaks while during laser indirect ophthalmoscope rest your back strengthen your back and neck muscles thank you thank you pradeep for that uh, wonderful presentation with lot of illustrations uh, which is much more needed for everyone including the uh, precious the young uh, surgeons to be uh, well versed surgeons so dr natrajan has uh, reiterated the point uh, that many of us may not uh, use the backrest and even if it's available it cannot be used properly instead he is suggesting that we should strengthen our muscles protagonist and antagonist muscle and he prefers dancing to that like, which is can be a wonderful thing to keep us mentally active also so are there any comments and additions from the other panelists i think you have to prevent not uh, he, he concluded that if you have a back problem you have to take care but i think you have to take care from day one and i remember steve charles mentioning that he uses a gym in between i don't know whether it's advisable but my gym trainer always says don't do weight on the day of surgery and he uh, that's the only for toning toning of the muscle not for muscle development but you have to keep all the muscles strong and that's what i think i i realize and i'm fortunate except when i have also designed for surgery and rest back rest and also wrist rest which in many somehow nobody is making it but i have my own self designed for all the ot like go so when i have were operating in kashmir then i developed back problem that there was no back rest there was no hand rest and so actually the elbow weight uh, uh, go sorry the shoulder weight goes to the elbow and elbow weight goes to the Uh, rest and when you are concentrating on your neck also as a problem. So I think the best is to to exercise. That's the point where you take. I think one very relevant point which was raised was restricting the use of indirect ophthalmoscopy in lieu of slit lamp examination and also doing slit lamp where it is possible. Uh, but if you restrict that, well. about 20 years back when i developed a little problem i restricted that and of course yoga and other things with it I haven't looked back it has been it has suited me very well and you don't require a full peripheral exam in every case so i think it's very important to weigh and of course using a light indirect of them thanks so comment sir so my question is to thank you dr mahesh sir and dr kamala sir like Uh, we have to balance between the two things. Like you, you should not miss the findings because the patient has come to you, and you need to take a each and every uh, inspect each and every part of that. How do we balance between like an indirect in every case, or is there a protocol which an institution has set like okay, in these particular patients, or at least in the follow visits, the IDO can be skipped, and we can do it only with the slit lamp examination. Actually, Madhu. i have the recommended chair and i use the indirect most of the time with a with a, a sitting in a, like 90 degree position for the patient and me and if you if i really want to depress then i put the, the thing back little and now the experience i can even see the periphery without depression also and i think even recommendation uh, detachment can look at all the breaks without depression but if it is really required then i put the flat but it's rare for me so main will be to most of the time you have to be aware of your straining your neck And when the day or time you are aware, I think one is exercise, and second is don't do that first. Exactly. Then I have a protocol. I think it will be different for each one. Right. And idea idea will be not to miss the finding. Yes, sir. Thanks. Ma'am, you wanted to comment. Ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute. Muna, you have to unmute. Yeah. 
thank you, Pradeep, for a very interesting and relevant talk. I think uh, what uh, problem many of us face is we are using ORs and OPD rooms, which are multi-user. So today I see, tomorrow, so I do surgery, tomorrow somebody else does it. So it's very difficult to personalize your equipment in the room in most situations. But we have to realize that a lot of chairs go up and down, a lot of tables go up and down. And we have to make that time to do that adjustment at the beginning of the day. And the height, usually, if it's a little below your waist, it's more comfortable. For people like me who are average size, touch wood, I don't have a problem as far as height is an issue. But people very short and very tall can face that problem as well. So I think for multi-user rooms, we have to make that adjustment at the beginning of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. Uh, there was a very, very interesting uh, presentation with Pradeep. I think uh, he covered a lot of What's important is for the youngsters who are starting to learn indirect ophthalmoscopy and then continuing should have this in their mind when they start because what you learn is what you continue to carry on. And uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, maintain like many a times I have two or three physiotherapists who has come as an attenders to their patient, observe me and then tell me, sir, you're sitting in a wrong position. Uh, the way you are, you know, all that, if you are conscious, as he pointed out, that's very important that uh, each one of us, especially as you go into your practice, the more cases you start seeing, you become very unconscious of all these things when you start, uh, you know, examining the periphery, retinal periphery and all that. So that's something we have to be reminding ourselves of what we are doing. And then the other thing is, stretching between uh, you know cases that's something uh, my teacher dr nam taught me how you should even simple exercises in between helps us to relax our muscles uh, and then you know continue with the work on so it's uh, it's important that we are conscious of what we are doing thank you sir Dr. Sarel, you have any comments on the ergonomics of what was showed? Sure, sir. Um, wonderful session. Um, thank you. And what I would like to add on is um, keep in mind all these points are quite relevant. The important thing about a posture as far as we consider in ergonomics is how long are you going to hold the posture? So if your procedure is going to be not taking much time, it's okay to be in a little bit of a wrong postures as well. But the issue here is what postures are becoming your habit? That's the key point. All of us need to be more mindful about what's the posture that we are most comfortable. And I'm stressing on the word most comfortable because many a time comfort is what we are conditioning ourselves. And it does not be, need to be a good one on the body. So become more mindful about the postures that we often fall into and then try to come out of that. So habituation is the key over there. Whichever uh, procedures that we do. So as uh, uh, the doctor said, the another people in the room. So like this, this forum, everybody is becoming conscious and aware about postures. I think there's a right beginning or the right, uh, you know, kind of an approach where if I'm going wrong continuously or constantly every other day, my colleagues can correct me. It's kind of very difficult to have that insight all the time because we feel so comfortable in those postures. Like our, I mean, our, our parents or teachers would have always told us like sit straight and upright and things like that, but it's difficult. We fall back. So it's good to have uh, your whole colleagues also be aware, even the nurses, all of them be aware so that they can be the guardians who can correct you when you are going to. The, po the point is, if it's going to be a long procedure, two hours or more than that, it's better to be very, very careful to have changing the postures. So there is no one uh, you know, uh, solution which fits everybody. We all are quite different. But 
if we are developing a certain postures and tightness and things like that that's what we call as habituation some muscles only will be always used or overused and most of them may not be used at all so become aware of the wrong postures that we can get into and the awareness itself will make us get out of that actually um, that, that that's the point that i just wanted to add on and apart from that um, ergonomics per se is not just the postures it's the the workstation adjustment so the way ma'am was telling that multiple people are using it so that's exactly the point before starting a procedure i may have to fit that whole um, environment everything according to my height my weight my anthropometry and that's the key actually so adjust your workstation so that you are not adjusting to whatever the workstation is and that's ergonomics basically thank you